Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, a, uh, just a, a mea culpa, we're, as faculty, we're supposed to do these things in areas beyond our expertise. And believe me, this is far beyond my expertise. Um, so, but it's topical. Of course, this is BATS and after uh, Cliff let off the pandemic with a terrific review of uh, the virus itself, I thought uh, no one had looked at the reservoir uh, the bat for these coronaviruses. Uh, so uh, the other uh, tough thing in picking topics for these journal clubs is to pick things the students don't pick. Uh, the students and the postdocs are so good at finding all the great articles. So you really have to go out of your way to try to find things that people haven't uh, dealt with. Uh, so I've, I've picked a couple uh, recent things about bats and reviewed some of the, the history related to this and uh, decided to target to call this the bleeding edge of Occam's razor. So we'll go with that. Uh, let's see, I can't advance. I have to advance here, right? All right, so why bats? Obviously with the coronavirus, uh, they're kind of interesting organisms and, and, and interesting animals and mammals and real outliers uh, and uh, just fascinating creatures as I've learned and I hope I can get across to you. And why Occam's razor, as, as you find out, uh, bats are really out there in a lot of ways. Obviously they fly, uh, they have very odd uh, migratory and, and metabolic pathways, and they can withstand these uh, tremendous range of viruses that wreak havoc on primates. And can we unite those about a common theme uh, that Occam's razor talks about, uh, bringing uh, disparate thoughts down into common pathways that allow us to gain some uh, understanding? And why bleeding edge? I, I confess this is from Max Kremel. Every, every time Max wants to uh, tell me about some new microscope or, or uh, some new technology or some new breakthrough that he's been involved with, and uh, it, it's always on the bleeding edge. Everything's on the bleeding edge with, with Max. And so the, the bats are really on the bleeding edge of evol evolution. And uh, that's where that came from. I'll dismiss that and, and get on with it. So why bats and why has this been enabled recently? There's uh, been a big effort to sequence uh, bats because of their uh, unique nature and the diversity of species uh, that cover all of the, the continents except Antarctica and really the islands every, everywhere except a few rare islands in the poles uh, to sequence a thousand bat sequences. And the first paper I gave you was, was a look at, at six sequences. This has really been pushed by uh, Emma Peeling at Dublin, but also by uh, Max Planck in Europe and uh, just some uh, labs in Wuhan in China, uh, really trying to get these bat sequences online uh, for two, two reasons. One, to learn a lot about uh, these animals and things that might be important for human disease we might get out of this. Um, and, and secondly, to to wake us up to the fact that we're now encroaching onto, onto just every realm of the planet and beginning to uh, drive stress in animals that cause them to, to shed viruses into uh, other species where they can recombine and then make transitions to get to us like influenza uh, does every year so successfully. Uh, so bats are important reservoir for viruses that, that uh, as we're living through right now have tremendous uh, impact on the economy and humans. So getting to know what the pyroma of bats is is gonna be extremely important. So with that, that in mind, uh, what, what, what are bats? So uh, with these uh, six genomes, they could begin to put bats in this kind of tree of life thing. And for a long time, I thought that bats lived up here with, with uh, rodents and that's where they were most closely allied. And just to look at my cheat sheet here to orient you, elephants and manatees are kind of up th th this end of this big branch point here and uh, primates uh, and we're here and rodents, which have the most uh, species divergence of any of the mammalian branches sit here, including the naked mole rat. 
And bats, with these six sequence, I think it convincingly, convincingly have oriented bats more closely to the ferroungulates, which I guess I knew nothing about what these were, but this includes the, the ungulates, the, the kind of herding animals like cows and horses and uh, antelopes and whatnot and carnivores, so cats and dogs, and, and bats are against carnivores, I, I can understand. And in fact, they orient down here. Uh, whales are also at this end of, the, of this bipartite branch of major mammalian uh, species. Now, the, the immune system of bats has been looked at more, more carefully, and many there have been several publications where immune genes tend to line in some ways, the patterning of the immune system is closer to human than to rodent. I think some of that is that the immune system in bats has been looked at in wild bats rather than in wild rodents. And those of you familiar with the wilding mice know that when you look at wild rodents, it's much closer to humans than in SPF uh, genetically uh, isolated rodents that we all work with. So I, I'm not so sure about that, but it, but it is true that bats uh, do have mate cells at proportions that are close to humans, gamma deltas that are close to humans. They're a little bit different than SPF animals. So that is out there. And there's two big radiations of, the, uh, of bats. They're, they're called yin and yang, the, the yin coroptera and the yang coroptera. Uh, the, these bats uh, share a lot of these special properties that we'll talk about uh, in trying to organize uh, understanding about the physiology of these animals and their remarkable tolerance to uh, viruses that uh, wreak such havoc in primate uh, genomes. So uh, they're way cool, for sure, uh, bats. They uh, first show up about in the fossil record about 64 million years ago. This is late Cretaceous. Dinosaurs have just been hit or very close to this time, get hit with the asteroid and are going out and the mammal radiation, plant radiation are really going strong. There are more species than any other um, species except uh, rodents. This is about 20% of the named species and they're on all continents except uh, the polar regions. Uh, they tend to be very important for pollination and seed dispersal, insect control. They, they look very social animals, live in huge colonies of millions of, organ, of, of animals. And the reason this is important is they uh, get together, uh, nestle one another, um, interact, just very dense um, uh, and very dense habitats, and, and so they pass things among them at very high rates. Uh, they have a very diverse diet um, from fruits and nectar and pollens and insects uh, to solely blood, uh, vampire bats, which, which drives a, an incredibly unique microbiome when you think about things that we, you don't have in blood that have to be gotten by vampire bats. And of course, they accomplish this uh, the way we accomplish our needs by uh, sequestering a microbiome makes up for things and, and genetic pathways that we need to synthesize things that we can't um, otherwise uh, uh, generate. They tend to have uh, low reproductive rates, which is, uh, we'll talk at the end, is, is kind of hurting some of their, some of the issues now related to uh, fungal intrusion into the species. They have incredible um, thermoregulatory properties including torpor, which mice do, which is the drop of metabolism and temperature that mice will do for a couple of hours, uh, particularly the way we breed um, our rodents. So we keep our rodents at suboptimal temperatures. They're all uh, kept at 22 degrees. They should be kept at 30 as their neutral set point when they're not devoting energy to uh, generating body heat uh, to stabilize their physiology. So in fact, all the mice we uh, work with, and it's really been worked on uh, well and pointed out by Jay Chawla when he was here, uh, are really um, managed under suboptimal conditions and they, they pay a price for that. that and so mice uh, use torpor to recover. And uh, we'll talk briefly about that, but Bats do the same thing, but in fact do the next step, which is hibernation, which is like torpor, but maintained for prolonged periods of time, uh, generally longer than 24 hours. And you can uh, 
maintain uh, awareness and sensation from the outside environment so that you're not completely cut off from the world, but you're sh really shutting down metabolic and physiologic pathways to allow um, repair and um, a rest uh, while the, or, the organism repairs. So a critical part of bat biology uh, and a, a remarkable um, uh, feat. And then you can awake yourself from hibernation with no cost to physiology or function. And of course, if you could plumb this in, in million species, it would be a lot easier to get to places like Mars, for instance, and repair damage from all that uh, cosmic radiation. They have incredible modes of orientation in space. They have very good visual acuity, but they also echo uh, locate and use magnetoreception. Magnetoreception is awareness of south from North Pole that allows them to migrate tremendous different distances up to 2000 kilometers, <coughs> excuse me. Echolocation is another extremely energetically um, difficult process where bats emit loud sounds that then are used like sonar to locate insects in flight. And are really the only, only animals that do this uh, mode of transportation, but uh, th this mode of uh, a location, but it allows them to locate prey, prey very, very quickly. Uh, bats are also very long lived. If you correct for body size and look at longevity, 19 of the 20 longest live mammals on the planet are bats, um, which I didn't know. Uh, the, the only non-bat is a naked mole rat, which many of you heard about. Um, so bats live a very long time despite this uh, metabolic uh, stress, uh, which is quite remarkable. Uh, they hibernate at around six degrees centigrade, uh, but their body temperature in flight is over 40 degrees centigrade. And they go from a hibernating heart rate of about 10 to 15 beats a minute uh, to a fl in-flight heart rate of over 1,000 beats uh, per minute, uh, burning up 1,200 calories an hour and raising their metabolic rate by 34-fold. So understanding how bats have evolved this complicated physiology and maintained uh, this interesting set of unusual properties is uh, what I'd like to address in the next uh, bit of time. And one important thing, I, I'll focus on the immunology, but an imp important thing is there's been positive selection of about a quarter of the mitochondrial genome and about 5% of nucleocoded oxfos genes that control um, metabolic programs that are essential, uh, I think, for understanding how bats arrived at this uh, physical state. So is there any way to, when we think about the unusual things that I've mentioned here, uh, to me, uh, what people pick out are powered flight, no other mammals really have powered flight where you can flap your wings and fly like a bird. Um, extremely high metabolic uh, flux uh, with these interesting um, extremes of torpor and hibernation. The ability to echolocate and magnetosense by sending out these intense bursts of sound and not damaging your ears and um, uh, losing uh, sense of direction. Longevity and this incredible viral tolerance where you can have up to 10 to the seventh virus um, per mil of blood uh, with no symptoms of viruses that have 50 to 70% mortality in humans and non-human. Uh, primates, so quite remarkable. So is there a common physiologic way to think about that? And that's the, the, the Occam's razor that I know many of you are aware of from this Franciscan friar and theologian who, who stated that entities should not be multiplied without necessity, or it's futile to do more things which can be done with fewer. And the idea is that uh, given a complex um, number of observations, it's easier sometimes to take the, the way they can make them all the simplest and, and that frequently the correct assumption than to make a bunch of uh, complicated, uh, unrelated assumptions about uh, multiple ways that you could get to the observation. So Occam's razor would state, is there any way uh, in, in terms of the topic today uh, we could pick all these disparate things about bats and organize them into a physiological Occam's razor. 
Uh, Occam got into trouble for that. I think he was discommunicated because he, he got into uh, twisting himself into pretzels about the, how, how one could explain God and all kinds of other things and uh, greater beings. And uh, he got into some trouble with the church. Uh, so we shared that with Galileo. Uh, but for every Occam, there's a Hickam's dictum, dictum. This is William Hickam, who was a chair of medicine at University of An Indiana. He said, a man can have as many diseases as he damn well pleases. Now, that is true. And uh, as we know, um, uh, people who are clinicians know well, people come in with uh, diseases like type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, cancer, um, atherosclerotic disease, uh, COPD, uh, but we uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, but we're now uh, beginning to understand that uh, that's a lot of diseases, but there may be common pathways to these diseases, uh, as uh, Occam said we should be thinking about, uh, that really puts inflammation front and center at a number of these diseases of uh, humans as, as we've aged past our, our genomes. So. Uh, these are remarkable uh, physiologic uh, stresses. So body temperature with that kind of range and heart rate uh, with that kind of range over two logs, metabolic rates over 30 fold uh, differences and a huge selection for oxfos genes. This is a vampire bat, the ability to, to live only on blood. Um, just remarkable uh, species adaptation around the planet in these uh, animals. So, so how might we think about this? So others have, have organized these things and thought about them. I've kind of oriented the way I've kind of put them together a little bit different. And we're gonna, we're gonna focus on this end of the spectrum where we, um, uh, the immunology is a little bit more relevant, but uh, where relevant, I think it's important to think of flight as the thing that really drives this. It drives the tremendous metabolic stress in these animals, uh, that's, mitigated a bit by um, systems that have developed evolutionary echolocation and magnetosensing that can at least minimize the time in flight. You can find prey much more quickly uh, in spatially exact ways with echolocation. It comes at a metabolic cost. Magnetosensing, you can get to these migratory places more quickly. Um, uh, but these tend to, to, to mitigate the metabolic stress uh, that in the end, and these studies have been done, I don't have uh, time to review them in bats, but looking at the generation of reactive oxygen, for instance, at, uh, at even at mitochondria, which is really the energy uh, point of the cell, the, the fuel pump of the cell, and documenting after long migratory states that there are more uh, mutations, say, even in mitochondrial genes than in uh, prior to migration. Um, not in all studies, but in some studies, and certainly increases in ROS. And that remarkably, bats uh, hibernate or have periods of torpor, and they can even repair mitochondrial DNA, which is organized a bit differently than the nuclear DNA. And so pathways by which uh, they restrict DNA damage are quite remarkable. There's a lot to be learned in, in uh, bats, which have increased uh, uh, heat shock proteins, autophagy pathways, a number of pathways that control the ability of cell to maintain proteostasis, which in the end is, is what uh, keeps functionality going. Hibernation and torpor are obviously ways to uh, re re restrict this and allow time for repair. So these are important things for uh, bats to, to be able to do. Um, but DNA damage, uh, we know is what we'll talk about, generates uh, interferon response. An interferon response is important in restraining uh, uh, viruses. And so this kind of linear um, Occam's razor, as, as you will, is more easy for us to understand. And we can also understand how mitigation of DNA damage and perhaps um, keeping a viral um, maintaining viral tolerance is a key to longevity of the species to, to, despite this incredible metabolic stresses on their uh, uh, lifestyle. So bats do have a lot of viruses. 
So this is the bat virome. It is biased to uh, coronaviruses uh, because of the outbreak. Obviously, people have gone in and began to really look for coronaviruses in uh, bats. There's a lot of these, including probably the next pandemic is sitting there. But if it's not a coronavirus, it will be one of these other viruses. Um, obviously, SARS-CoV-2 is what we're dealing with now. This virus, which, as you know, uh, doesn't hasn't been um, pulled directly out of bats as, as Cliff went over at the beginning of this uh, pandemic, uh, but as recombined in other species, uh, perhaps pangolins, uh, other species along the way to create recombinant viruses, which is the, mo the real raison d'etre for all these viruses that work through other species uh, from bats to get to humans and then establish reservoirs in intermediate species. Uh, so there are a lot of, if you put SARS-CoV back into a bat, it gets a very transient bacteremia, whether bat cells or live bats, um, they, they don't get sick of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, suggesting that maybe they're not the reservoirs, but suggesting that maybe they would get bacteremic for long periods of time of that recombined virus. Um, obviously SARS-CoV-1 uh, came out of, um, out of bats, all the other coronavirus, the MERS that has a camel intermediary. Um, there are important animal viruses that also can leak into humans at very high mortality, encephalitis, kind of 50 percentile or so of these paramyxoviruses. These are these positive strand RNA viruses. These are negative strand RNA viruses. Nipah and Hindra viruses get into horse, uh, pigs and horses. Uh, cause a lot of uh, disease on those important agricultural uh, animals, but can get into handlers of those animals and cause severe disease in humans in Southeast Asia and Australia. So these are, uh, came from bat species. Rabies is kind of the classic virus, Lissa virus that comes from, there are many uh, different rabies-like viruses that come out of bats. Uh, this goes back 2000 years BC and was the original uh, origin of uh, Louis Pasteur's vaccine efforts, a lot of his history in rabies and, and medicine uh, coming from bats. Nowadays, these recombined bats that have gotten into uh, raccoons, skunks, uh, uh, dogs uh, that worldwide are, are more common causes of, of rabies than bats usually. And in the United States, the, the most common cause is probably cats because People think their dog can get rabies, but their, can't, their cat can't. So they vaccinate their dogs, but not their cats. And they get rabies from a cat who gets, get, gets into it with a bat or something, or a skunk. Rotaviruses, important cause of childhood diarrhea. There are a lot of rotaviruses. There are a lot of these arboviruses. Not surprisingly, they eat insects, uh, whether they're really the vectors versus the arthropod, uh, versus the uh, insect uh, mosquitoes that transmit yellow fever, dengue, Zika, or West Nile. But it suggests that these uh, have intimate relationships with the arthropods that they, they uh, feed on. And uh, filoviruses like Marburg and Ebola that have tremendous uh, um, impact in uh, parts of Africa, parts of Asia for Ebola virus that uh, are, have very high mortality and cause massive coagulopathy and systemic um, cytokineopathies, much like uh, severe SARS-CoV-2. So uh, bats have all these and they're uh, really essentially asymptomatic for the vast majority. Occasionally you can take some viruses used by old world versus new world viruses. So rabies, for instance, grew up in old world viruses before it kind of came over the Bering Straits with dogs and, and then bats uh, that made their way across. So th these, um, occasionally you can find viruses that will cause disease in bats, but it's, it's, it's very unusual. Uh, and usually because of the, the high interferon levels that they maintain, uh, but there's tons of other viruses, which has really pushed the need to, kind of understand this uh, viral, um, uh, you know, what the virome is and what the risk is for the next big pandemic. Now, in general, uh, bats are asymptomatic, but when they get stressed, they begin to secrete virus in urine, 
uh, and saliva and other secretions. So uh, Nipah virus and Hendra virus that infect horses and, and, and pigs get uh, reach very high titer in urine of bats that are infected uh, or carrying those, those viruses that uh, come under environmental stress of temperature or encroaching on their, their habitats. And th th this is gonna drive more of this with climate change. And then papayas get infected and fruit handlers get infected. These are fruit bats. Uh, people get infected who eat the papaya or the, the horses or the, the, the dog, uh, pigs get infected. And they get into these intermediate hosts, be it camels or civet cats or raccoons. And then when humans encroach on the, these reservoirs or the bats directly, uh, humans can pass them human to human as they evolve uh, human specific receptors, much like flu virus and much like uh, SARS-CoV-2 and all these other viruses. And occasionally we can pass these to reservoirs like you've probably heard about the mink infections in, in Europe that came uh, or the gorilla infections down in San Diego that came from human handlers transmitting SARS-CoV-2 uh, to uh, uh, animal reservoirs and they can transmit both ways. And then because humans are uh, uh, so gregarious and urbanized, it gets into urban environments and gets sustained in cats and uh, raccoons and urban environments and whatnot and, and, and really sustained by human to human spread as we see uh, with um, uh, human populations. So uh, you can get all these viruses out of bats, but are they really uh, tolerant? And in fact, now there have been a lot of infections with bat cell lines, but now some labs, this is from, uh, uh, I, I, I believe from Max Planck labs uh, in, in Europe that have set up bat colonies to be able to do um, primary bat colonies and primary bat infection. And now there are a number of these, including uh, I believe Nipah has been done, rabies have been done with the same kind of idea. But if you inject Marburg virus, this is a filovirus that has 50% mortality in humans uh, into uh, Egyptian rosette bats that are the, this kind of fruit bat that I believe a fruit bat that, that uh, is the natural host of this organism. They become viremic. They, they peak with large numbers of organ, organisms like tend to virions, like tend to seven per mill of blood or even mill of some tissues by about five to seven days. But then they clear over a couple of weeks, uh, but they intermittently uh, can shed virus for some time. And in bat colonies, it's thought that the close um, uh, interposition of all these animals on top of each other, that they're either passing it around all the time where these things are maintained in the colony uh, in newborn animals or in animals that come in from other colonies, or that there are persistent viruses that, that maintain uh, some reservoir in these animals. These are RNA viruses. When you infect them, these, these Bar Marburg infects monocyte macrophages, CD14 positive cells. And you can now, they're developing bat reagents, many cross react with human. You can pull out the monocyte macrophages or you can pull out the tissue. I'm showing you the splenocytes and ask about what genes are induced kinetically across this infectious period. And what you see is there's very few cytokines early. There's some uh, IL-1 and IL-8 up here and some TNF over here. And then all the interferon genes. So here's all the interferon inducible genes and uh, another group in here and ISGs over here and these RNA editing genes over here. So a lot of interferons come up, but they're fairly acute. You have an acute spike and then they're kind of terminated. And that correlates with, uh, if you do keg analysis, you get a lot of these type one interferon antiviral defense pathways. Now what's striking is if you take these same cells, either the CD14 uh, splenocytes or the general tissue, and you look at the cytokine pathways, they're almost nothing. So these little red blips are a few chemokines, uh, IL-1, uh, TNF and trail, a little bit of BAF, uh, not a whole lot happening in the, in the, chemo, in the cytokine field. So there's this dissociation between an early uh, 
acute interferon response that is pretty abruptly truncated, and then a very little inflammatory response. And if you think about it, uh, this is what uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, looks like in uh, kids. So kids, and I, again, we know some kids get this, but in, in general, kids and young people have a very uh, acute interferon response. They clear virus, uh, it goes away, and they have very little inflammatory response, where older people my age tend to get uh, a, a, a more gradual interferon response, greater viral proliferation early, you eventually clear the virus, but now you enact this massive inflammatory response that is the cause of the mor morbidity and the tissue damage. So if you go into bats, now this is from the genome studies, uh, and began to look at how they have uh, set up this uh, uh, intricate pathway between interferons and inflammation to control the sweet spot uh, with uh, perhaps to attenuate, as I pointed out, uh, the response to self-DNA generated by the ROS stress. And as a side effect, you gain um, success against viruses in the environment is the attenuation of some inflammatory genes. So all the viruses, for instance, had lost this leucine rich repeat uh, gene, LLRC70, uh, was inactivated with lots of different mutations. So it's been attacked a number of times. And IL-36 is an IL-1 gene family, IL-36G, it's been shown to be up in a lot of uh, inflammatory diseases in humans. These genes are knocked out of all bats and have been shown in knockouts in, in mice uh, to flow into and to support NF-kappa B inflammatory cytokine pathways. There's a lot of positive selection for I1 beta, this early gene, and Inava, it's another one of these scaffolding proteins that tends to scaffold together complexes to make more efficient um, uh, signaling through these early on, through these complexes that get uh, early genes going. So there's clearly been some evolutionary pressure on these genes. And looking more broadly across immune genes, you can see that a lot of early genes are selected for like some of the 17A and D in the epithelium, uh, IL-1 beta, and some of the nu nuclear receptors like TLR7, TLR9, uh, epithelial cytokines like T TSLP, um, IL-10 receptor beta, there's a lot of interesting uh, positive selection for immune genes that might be attenuating uh, inflammatory signals or biasing the early response to a very acute response that is in uh, quickly terminated. At the other end of the spectrum, there seems to be evidence for selection for resistance against uh, viruses. So there's a large expansion of Apobex, these cytidine deaminases that get incorporated into viral particles and wreak havoc on the, on the next generation of viruses as they uncode in the next host. Uh, this for uh, comparison is cows and dogs, uh, just showing more like the human uh, locus where there, there's huge expansion of this locus. So in general, from uh, there have been a lot of bat cell uh, studies using cells from bats, primar primary cells, but mostly cell lines, and increasingly animal infection models from labs that have set up bat infection models, not trivial, you can imagine, uh, that have shown that type one and type three interferon pathways are intact, uh, but not sustained. They, they reach their peak quickly uh, and then resolve. And this seems to be reinforced by evolutionary hits uh, as, uh, uh, suggested by these new deep uh, genomic sequence done on, the, on these bat genomes. Some bats, not all, even have constitutive type 1 and type 3 interferons in blood, mostly type 1 interferons, type 1, either alpha or beta, uh, but not, this isn't universal. Inflammatory cytokines seem to be attenuated across all bats, uh, so uh, that is held up even with inoculation of bats in vitro with things like um, uh, you know, poly IC or LPS. And antibodies in, are interesting as well in that they're relatively short-lived, they, they last months, and then they attenuate much like kids who get SARS-CoV-2 again, as we're learning about this virus. Uh, but with reinfection, they quickly uh, uh, reappear and, and contribute, seem to contribute in positive ways to 
a lower viremia on the, on the secondary infection. So they, they clearly get neutralizing antibodies, but they have the same kind of context as kids and people who get uh, asymptomatic uh, SARS-CoV-2. So a nucleic acid recognition is a key part of, of what bats do. And as you know, central to this is the mitochondrial sensor MAVs, which is picking up a lot of these RNA uh, intermediates, including double-stranded RNA and sting, uh, which is picking up these cyclic di dinucleotides generated by recognition of double-stranded DNA, whether it appears by stress in the cytosol or from a viral particle. And key to getting to downstream interference for both of these is to be able to um, phosphorylate TBK to get to IRF3, phosphorylate IRF3, dimerize it, get it to the nucleus and drive the early interferon response. So these have to hook up to interferons. And we're, we're learning a lot about how this pathway evolutionary, evolutionarily, even in humans, has been subjected to tinkering. Uh, because of the large number of uh, increasing number in, of inflammasomopathies uh, that um, are genetic variants, gain of function, loss of function in these pathways, and stingopathies or interferonopathies uh, that occur through uh, alleles of sting that have been affected uh, by gain of function, loss of function in human populations that are much more frequent than, than I think we appreciate. And, some uh, Asian, Southeast Asian populations, a third of people have haplo alleles of, uh, of sting. So the, you have to get to IRF3, and there have been studies showing that IRF3 works really well in bats. So if you simply take a wild type, in this case, is bad IRF3, and put it into knockout cells versus altered here as human, human IRF3, or look at poly IC, uh, and then use a GFP readout like a virus. The bat ser uh, phosphorylation of IRF3 on this unusual serine residue uh, is correlates with better antiviral immunity. This is just viral plaque assay, just showing it works at a uh, greater um, uh, dilution. So bat is, is more active in a human cell or a bat cell and has more activity here on the blue line, the bat one, and suppressing um, the, these uh, against poly-IC and, and generating interferons even when transfected in at the same amount. So there's more and more of these studies in primary bat cells pulling out individual genes showing uh, how they might work. Now there's a question about how TLR789, this from Noel Barton, uh, Jonathan Kagan review, uh, the nuclear uh, interacting TLRs get to uh, type 1 interferons. So the adapter TRIF hooks up with TLR3 and with TLR4 when it comes to the endosome through this Karnatirop tram adapters. And TRIF can phosphorylate TBK1. So it, you can get to IRF3 through um, TLR3 and 4, but it's always been a mystery how 7, 8, and 9, uh, which only uh, adapt through MITE88, get to type 1 interferons. And this was resolved by a, a nice paper in, in Nature uh, from Vienna, I believe, in 2020, uh, pulling down, uh, it, well, it started with an investigation of the solute transporter, SCL115A4, which I believe is a histidine trans transporter, which is a, a risk allele in lupus and other auto-inflammatory diseases, like IRF5, which is a risk allele, and TLR9, and I believe seven in, in lupus, these nuclear uh, TLRs. And what uh, they pull down with a, a mass spec kind of approach, pull down approach in primary cells, was this protein TASL, T-A-S-L. And TASL is the protein that recruits, uh, gets phosphorylated, and when it's phosphorylated, for phosphorylated recruits IRF5. And this is the mechanism by which TLRs, uh, endosomal TLRs, link up to interferons. But what this exposes is a natural break between the interferon response through the IRF3 or IRF5 pathway and the inflammatory response. So what I've illustrated here is this PLXIS motif. This is uh, 
uh, hydrophilic lysine, non-aromatic isoleucine serine motif. This is the mo motif that recruits IRF5. And there's only three other proteins, as shown by James Chen in a nice science paper in 2015, that contain this PLXIS motif that's Sting, TRIF, and MAVS. And that's the way you get to IRF3. So this is an interesting nexus in the inflammation cytokine gene pathway. I would be simply astounded if we don't find viruses that find uh, mimics for uh, TASL or SCL15A4 uh, that bifurcate this pathway and, and get at a separation of, of cytokine storm uh, from the interferon response. And, uh, uh, but very interesting papers. Now there's another uh, series of attacks on the inflammasome. It turns out that bats have completely knocked out the pihin family genes. That includes IFI-16 and uh, AIM-2, which is the DNA inflammasome. They're all transected in bats. One bat, I forgot which one, has, has a piece of one of these suggesting that the bats originally had these pathways and knocked them all out. So there's no other mammal that has knocked out all these pihin uh, proteins of pyrin domain and the, and the hin domain that recognizes DNA. Uh, bats have uh, none of these, humans have five. And bats uh, have also dampened a uh, sting. So bats have lost a serine that's maintained, serine 358, that's at all non-bat species have the serine residue. All bats have knocked this out. And it, at least in bat uh, cell lines, uh, this attenuates the interferon response and may be one of the ways that you cut off the response uh, by losing serine uh, 358 as compared to humans. Now, it turns out it's not so simple. Uh, as I said before, a lot of humans have uh, hypomorphic alleles of sting, about a third in Southeast Asia, maybe 10% in Europe. Uh, so, the, I mean, you know about sting gain of function uh, pathways that um, can cause stingopathies like savvy disease. So uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of tinkering uh, with sting going on in the human genome, but bats seem to have hit a sweet spot uh, where they can emphasize the interferon pathway. They've also taken on the inflammasome. And of course, there are a lot of inflammasome uh, mutations in humans, not only in ORP3, but the other major inflammasomes. But in bats, just to summarize this done in, um, a number of bat species, there's lower induction transcriptionally, there's lower ASC specs in bats, there's lower IL-1 beta response, uh, they have a dampened splice variant, uh, the, the leucine-rich domain is altered a little bit, and the virus is controlled, but there's much less IL-1 beta and less paraptosis. So bats have attacked both the inflammasome, inflammasomeopathy, kind of into the spectrum, and the interferon, interferonopathy uh, into the spectrum. So we end up with selection for interferons and interferon inducible genes. I've told you in material I can't, don't have time to cover, they've selected for autophagy and transporter genes and heat shock proteins um, while downregulating a number of mechanisms for inflammation at the level of the DNA inflammasome that might be the target of the reactive oxygen, uh, damaged intermediates released during their metabolism and, dam and released IL-1 and attenuated sting to end up attenuating uh, their inflammatory response. Now, this suggests a tolerance, and I'm gonna close with a, a little bit of discussion about tolerance as a strat evolutionary strategy to deal with uh, pathogens. And uh, this is really, uh, pushed to the forefront in, in this paper. I encourage uh, all of you, if you have time, to go back and read this from Machitov, David Schneider, and Miguel Suarez, uh, looking at how animals have established um, a detente with organisms over time. And you basically have two ways to do this. You need to mitigate damage caused by the pathogen by limiting which tissues it's in. If you can keep a pathogen in epithelium, you do a lot better than if it gets to heart cells or brain cells, just because those cells can replace or to liver, for instance, that has regenerative capacity. But secondly, uh, and this really developed from, uh, these guys didn't invent this, it was built on uh, data from plant systems. Uh, 
uh, that if you could develop tolerance to damage, uh, you, you could accrue um, um, a benefit. So there was two things going on, tolerance to the pathogen and tolerance to the immune system. And Rustan's lab went, went, went on to develop, to isolate GDF-15, this kind of hormone that um, drives, uh, is a target of sympathetic stimulation, drives uh, generation of uh, triglycerides from the liver that sustain the heart at rapid uh, beat and it's a major fuel for the heart when it's uh, operating under stress and inflammation. So this is an example of tolerance driven by the immune system. Jay Chawla's lab looked at some hypometabolic states uh, that can promote disease tolerance, also mediated by adrenergic uh, signaling into the um, beige fat compartment, also shown by uh, Andrew Wong at Yale. I'll just skip this in the interest of time, but uh, from a Jay's lab, uh, what he pointed out is that animals maintained in vivariums, this is mice now, under less than optimal temperature, not at metabolic equilibrium, have to put energy into maintaining a metabolic state uh, in, in the lower than optimal temperature. And so they have more tolerance than resistance. Uh, they put more efforts into tolerizing uh, in, in this state. If you raise them to metabolic equivalents, uh, so at 30 degrees, they don't have to put any, any energy into metabolism. They put energy, they have more energy to put into resistance. The problem with that is that if you give them LPS, they generate a lot of reactive uh, intermediates and they become tolerant to LPS. So remember, we think of mice as not having, not being like humans because they don't have good survival, they, they have relatively high survival to LPS. But in fact, if you put mice at metabolically uh, optimal temperature, uh, they look more like humans. But what Ajay also showed is if you energetically stressed animals, that is you put them in a hypometabolic state like torpor or hibernation, and my mice do torpor, uh, then you can put them into a tolerant state. And this is what bats do. So two really interesting papers. So uh, just to cover a little neuroscience to get totally out of my realm of comfort. Uh, these two papers from Tsukuba uh, University in Japan and from Harvard uh, Med School, identify genes in, in mice that induce torpor. And in fact, we have these genes, they're just not activated. And torpor is this hypothermic hypometabolic state. If they activate these genes, what are called QRFP, these, uh, these are RFP amide set of neuropeptides. There's kind of five members of this family, the signal through GPCRs that have been identified, GP130 for the QRFP. Um, neurons. These are in the periventricular hypothalamus, and they had been implicated in satiety and sympathetic discharge, um, uh, a few other things I've, I've forgotten. Uh, they, they, they had been implicated in some of those pathways, but not in uh, torpor. And what these, uh, you know, now with what you can do with, uh, with, in neuroscience is absolutely amazing. They could identify these neurons, optogenetically activate them with adenoviruses and show that the first step to going into torpor is to vasodilate. You can see the temperature of the tail, this is a thermosensor. The temperature of the tail is they just open up all their pores and get rid of heat. Uh, they just cool their body like they're in a refrigerator down to 24. They lower their heart rate down dramatically. They lower their metabolic thing and they sink into torpor. So not only could they induce torpor, they could induce hibernation in rodents. So th this is keeping them this way for over 24 to 48 hours, and yet they're still responsive to the environment. Um, they're shutting down all of their metabolic systems, and yet there's no evidence of organ pathology, and they can spontaneously revive if they stop, stop uh, stimulating these uh, neurons. So quite remarkable with a lot of um, potential health repercussions when you think about humans trying to get into space travel or repair organs after severe injury. Now, uh, nature loves a vacuum. I, I'm, I'm quitting with these slides. Uh, you, many of you probably know about white nose syndrome, pseudogymnoascus destructans. This is a fungal specialist. It infects all Eurasian bats, essentially. 
It was imported into the United States and Canada in about 2006, rapidly spread across bat colonies. And while they're hibernating, they get this fungal growth on their nose and, and it in, invades their wings. They get this destruction in their wings and uh, it, it can kill them by the metabolic stress. So they essentially get waked up uh, when this uh, fungi uh, grow. So these are canidia that are in the environment in the caves. Uh, they really can't grow except on bats. They're, they're completely uh, dedicated to bats. They make tons of collagenases and they develop hyphae on these bats. Uh, and they don't grow hyphae until they get below minus 20. So they, they really live in these cool caves and then attack these hibernating bats and they drill into their wings and their nose. And the bats get restless and wake up and, and get drained of their metabolic stores and, and have very high mortality. It's all, almost like myxotoma virus in, in Russia it was introduced into bat colonies that were just decimated. And in Europe, you can see what happens is that they, they don't get as high a fungal load. And so they tend to wake up before they get uh, uh, so many uh, fungi on them and, and they've learned how to uh, survive with these bats, uh, survive with these fungi. And in fact, this is happening in bat colonies in the United States. Some are being decimated, particularly the micro, the little tiny bats. The bumblebee bat, I think is the smallest uh, mammal there is. But these uh, uh, bats are being selected with the sweep of this fungus across Canada and the United States, selecting for bigger bats, bats that wake up earlier, and bats that can wake up before this loss of energy expenditure, emaciation, and morbidity. So we're seeing selection in motion as these bats begin to uh, fight these um, uh, fight the morbidity of this fungal infection. Remarkably, when they emerge, they, they die of cytokine storm. So they get a, a reconstitution syndrome, kind of like uh, um, transplant patients can get or, or patients with, um, uh, um, with CAR-T uh, T cells. So I'm gonna stop there. I, I haven't had time to really get it much at this end of the, the spectrum. I'm trying to convince you that there is an Occam's razor that I think uh, bats have really solved a very interesting uh, and complex dynamic. I don't think this runs completely backwards. I don't think you can just raise your interferon response and maybe run this way, but I think there's a potential you could do some of that. And I think as genes are being selected and uh, tweaked, as we see how sting is being tweaked and inflammasone is being tweaked, and even in human populations, there's some thought that maybe uh, tweaking some of these pathways, perhaps dealing with senescence and, and other issues related to DNA damage, uh, there might be ways to drive things backward. Will we ever be able to jump up and fly? I highly doubt it, uh, but we may be able to uh, learn a lot about metabolic stress in humans and uh, human diseases. So with that, uh, I'll quit. Again, uh, uh, something I don't know much about, but I must say I find these absolutely incredible uh, creatures and I'll stop there. Great, thanks Rich. If that's something you don't know much about, I am fear, feared of topics that you do know something about. That was really impressive, thank you. Um, any questions? I have one myself, actually. I'm just a little bit confused. So when a bat gets infected, um, it has a much reduced innate immune response, less interferon, but does clear the virus after a short period of time, it sounds like, if I understood that graph correctly. So what's, what's clearing the virus? Is it just the adaptive immune system is kicking in fast enough? So actually, they do have a high interferon response. It's just terminated very early. Oh, okay, so it's the same question. So very what's... acute and very high, but it's a kinetic issue. And it's cut off the back end. And then the inflammatory response is completely cut off. And if, if I've read the SARS-CoV-2 literature right, this is precisely what asymptomatic carriers do and children do. They have this very robust early interferon response. A few epithelial cytokines like IL-1, TSLP, IL-8, but a darth of the usual chemokines and a downstream TNFs and, and things that you see. And then it cuts off very acutely and, and then they, they get kind of a modest antibody response that's somewhat short-lived, but they're highly protected, at least for months anyway. Uh, 
and even with second infections, they may shed for a while, and that's what keep it going in the bat colony. But they, they seem to have really hit the sweet spot between interferon and inflammatory, this bifurcating pathway. And I think learning about that will teach us a lot about how to intervene in a number of human diseases where I think these get a little out of whack, not just viral infections. Very cool. Uh, any other questions? I see Matia, I see a, qu a chat question. Oh. About how about it. HLA in all of this? Yeah, there's been no, uh, in, in the bats anyway, a HLA doesn't pop up anywhere on any of the things. And, and you know, as I know you're aware, uh, C22A certainly comes up in the bat screens and in a lot of the human screens against virus. And so a lot of these cells take on the ability to present um, class two. Some of you may have heard uh, Becker talk yesterday about GMCSF and converting macrophages monocyte macrophages from an antigen presenting cell to a phagocytic inflammatory cell. So these pathways are tightly integrated. I think we're gonna hear about this and how they integrate into tissue physiology, this interferon repair C antigen, uh, DNA repair pathways, autophagy pathways, as distinct from inflammation, bring in myeloid cells, clean up the debris, um, you know, kill the invaders, ROS pathways uh, that have the off-target tolerance effects. And that threading that needle is, is gonna have a lot to do with it. The HLA hasn't really, uh, in, among the bats, hasn't really laid out as, uh, um, as a marker for any of these, nor for many of these disease uh, things like SARS-CoV-9, I'm not aware of a real HLA contribution to morbidity or mortality. Good question. Mark, you had a question. Yeah, good choice of topic, Rich. I, th I thought bats were cool before I knew their immunology was cool. Um, yeah, you went caving. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> um, so it seems like some of these adaptations are, are really closely linked, or at least you're suggesting they're closely linked with uh, being able to take on these low metabolic states that are important for the, the certain organisms. So is it also turned on and off in those states? I mean, are the viral loads, bats pack up, right? Are, are they, are they uh, having different responses when they're all packed up in the cave in, in basically torpor versus when they're out in the environment? Do they, do they respond fundamentally differently when they get infected in those different conditions? Yeah, so it, that's a great question. It was thought for a long time that part of the response to the bats was the fever of flight. So you may have noticed they've reached 41 degrees when they're flying, and um, Anita could chime in if I'm wrong about this, but I think with histoplasma and uh, coxie, some fungi, it's felt that the high temperature of birds may be what protects them and keeps the fungus in their guano, um, and, and, and maybe it's the temperature. But people have taken bat cells, at least, and look at bat virus through hibernating colonies. And in the bat cells, if you infect them in 41 or you infect them at, at room two, you know, 37, they, it doesn't really matter. They, they follow the exact same kind of clearance of the virus. So enzymatic processes related to that temperature span and the clearance of, of these viruses doesn't seem to be that big of a part of the picture. Um, and when you look at bat colonies uh, that are in hibernation, you can't find lots of vi more virus than, than you can on an active bat. So it, it seems to be a place where they do shed and because they are under stress and get virus through the colony, but they still seem to be able to strain it and not kill people off in torpor or hibernation. And as the fungus shows, if, if you tweak them enough, Torpor and hibernation, you're still aware of your environment and it, it will wake you up. And if you get waked up too many times, they can't repair. And that, that's what's uh, proving so devastating in these fungal diseases. Crazy. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, uh, Rich, thank you again for a fantastic talk. And again, remind everybody to hope to see you at three o'clock today for practice of science. So have a good day, everybody. See you next week. <laughs>